I would like to um, begin this presentation by sharing with you one of the experiences that I had, among a great many I have had, living with wild creatures. It has become uh, somewhat of a pattern that in this hectic world we call conservation, that we sometimes seem to forget that the ultimate resource that we work for is to ensure that wild creatures and the places they depend upon last. And the everyday existence that we all have and the efforts that you as conservation officers make, the challenges you face, the inevitable problems and frustrations, it is often easy to forget that the very reason for our existence, the very reason for our profession, the very reason for your job is that wild animals matter. I have been one of the most extraordinarily fortunate human beings that I know. And the reason is because I have been able to spend a great deal of time with wild animals, often alone, sometimes in the company of other human beings. And I have seen and witnessed extraordinary things. Much of my recent research career has been dealt, has dealt with large mammals, bears, caribou, moose, etc. I was uh, spending time on the rutting grounds of woodland caribou on the island of Newfoundland a number of years ago. And as always, it was just after first light that I left my camp and was walking across these extraordinary barrens that in the fall burst open with these extraordinary reds and siennas and browns and which are sort of dotted with these small pools of water that freeze just so lightly overnight to have this clear white ice upon them that's just this thin and that disappears by the time the late afternoon sun has risen again. I was walking along a ridge line and looked down on this broad expanse of bog and small shrub communities that were throwing this kind of color back at me. The sky was just turning blue and it looked like it was going to be one of those absolutely extraordinary days. I looked and I saw two or three companies of caribou, the big males with their big bronzed antlers and their black faces, their big white manes hanging over those huge necks, and the females walking behind, their hooves clicking, the calves following with them. And I could see these two or three groups of animals approaching one another. And out of the corner of my eye, I also saw a very large bear. Black bears on the island of Newfoundland are very plentiful, and they're very big, and they're highly predatory. They don't just kill calves, they kill adult caribou as well. As I was watching this kind of unfold, and as the ground fog began to dissipate, there was a band of showers looked like it might be rain or snow, it was coming across the landscape. And for a moment I lost sight of these animals meandering across this extraordinarily beautiful country. And then suddenly as that band of cold rain passed, I looked down and I could see that this bear had decided that he had an opportunity. 
He began to move himself from one small patch of trees to another, aligning himself so he could get closer to these small groups of animals. I knew he was going to make a play, and I knew that I was going to see it. I watched as those caribou groups began to meander down these leads. Caribou leave these tracks on the land that are very noticeable, and they follow them religiously. And they were coming closer and closer and closer to this bear. And as they finally sort of turned a corner where he would have been visible, he exploded. Now a bear is unlike an elk or a mule deer or a caribou or a moose. He does not need two or three steps to get to top speed. He is capable of running at exactly the same speed as a fine racehorse, 33 feet per second. And if you've never seen them explode toward you in a charge, or never seen them explode in a predatory chase, then I hope you do, because it is something to behold. That bear exploded from out of his resting position. The ground was very wet, and as he exploded towards those caribou, which saw him instantly and turned to escape him, every time he pounded into that ground, a spray of water flew back from his body. And those caribou turned with their eyes wide, running away from him, the water flying from them, and bands of sunlight were falling through this air filled with moisture from the recently passed rain. And thousands of droplets, each one a tiny rainbow, flew from that bear's glistening black body. And I watched as that bear got closer and closer and finally lunged and tipped a female off her legs. But she recovered before he could break her back. And she escaped. You do not need to be told ever again what beauty is. You never need to be instructed why wildlife matters ever again once you have witnessed just one such incident. But something that we do need to be reminded about is that for some reason, a myth has arisen in North America that that kind of opportunity, that that kind of miraculous encounter, that the survival of wildlife in those circumstances and our opportunities to see them, to experience them, to live with them, to learn from them, that that is just some accident. And if there is one myth that this movement and every person in this room has to work to dispel in the public mind of the people of the United States of America and Canada, it is this foolish notion that wildlife exists by accident. Wildlife exists because we have worked to keep it. And the only reason that I could see what I saw that day, and the only reason I have seen so much in this extraordinary life I have been able to lead, is because we have collectively worked to make it so. There's another myth that plagues us also, plagues you every single day in your job. 
And that is that conservation is a simple business. Your jobs are simple. You get paid just to do fun things. Biologists just get paid to go out and do fun things. How hard can your job be? You know how hard it can be. But the problem is that people in Canada and the United States do not know. And that's why they take it for granted. I have had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in a lot of parts of the world. And I can assure you that our wildlife legacy is nothing to be taken for granted. This idea that conservation is a simple business. You know, I meet a lot of families. They come up to me after a lecture or some other event where I'm attending, and they come up and they introduce themselves, and then they introduce their children. And they'll have three children, let's say. And they'll say to me, Mr. Mahoney, I'd like you to, introduce, I'd like you to meet my children. I'm very pleased to do that. And this is, this is John. And you know, John, well, John is going to be a lawyer. Very matter-of-fact, proud statement. John is going to be a lawyer. And this is Mary. And, you know, Mary would like to be uh, a teacher. And then they'll come to the third child, and almost always the child of this inclination is introduced last. You can tell that the parents love this child to death, but they'll say something like, Oh, and uh, this is Billy. And Billy, he just wants to spend time outdoors and be with animals. As though Billy has already decided to become part of something that's easy, like a holiday. Well, conservation happens to be probably the most complicated issue we face in the world today. And believe me, before we are halfway through this century, every human being on this planet, in the wealthy nations and in those that are not, will come to realize it full bore, in their face, inescapable. So I come to honor you, and I mean that because I know this business. I know this business really well. And I know what it takes to make it work. So I come to honor you in the context of destroying these myths. North American conservation history is about achievement. It's about achievement it's about challenges, and it's about overcoming odds that are absolutely unbelievable. And you are part, an absolutely, incredibly integral, vital part of that movement. You cannot be taken out of it and have us as a society expect that the conservation of wildlife will succeed. You probably forget that in the melee of every busy day. But that is a truth that is inescapable. There are two basic principles on which conservation in North America is based. There are several, but two are most important. One is called the public trust, which means that the state holds wildlife in trust for the people of a nation. And the second is that the allocation of access to wildlife in any form hunting, angling, or in any form, is based on the rule of law. And as conservation officers, you deal directly with those two issues. This is why you exist. The public trust and the public must have trust in you. And the allocation 
of access to wildlife by law, fair, equitable, democratic. You were there from the beginning. Many people fail to realize that when we started this business of conservation out of a desperate time, which I will come to, the very first things we had to do was to create laws. And we did that. And then we found that because we did not have people to enforce those laws, the laws were meaningless. And many of the very first great efforts we made in conservation in North America was to create laws and to provide people who could enforce them. You are the front line of conservation. You are the people that people see. And it's not just that they see you because and say, there's an authority figure who may check me for my permit or my tag or whether my boat is operating properly or whatever the issue is. You signify that the law matters. You signify that your country believes that the law matters. and that the enforcement of those laws matter. The object of the game is not to catch bad people. Really, the object of the game is to enforce in the minds of the 90 or 95 percent of the good people that the law matters. And you are the people that remind the citizens of the United States of America and Canada that the laws of conservation matter. You know most laws are enforced by the public conscience. We all know that it is impossible for any enforcement agency or any enforcement institution to try to reach everyone. But it is the presence, it is the presence of your authority. It is the presence of your person that when people see it, they realize that your country cares about these laws and will do things to keep them enforced. Everywhere I go and talk to people who are involved in the enforcement aspect of conservation, people talk about the expanded duties that have been forced upon the organizations and individuals. This is not something that has happened only in Idaho or in adjacent states. It's happening in every Canadian province. It's happening everywhere. And these throw up incredible challenges for people and incredible frustrations. Because there is only so much that people can do, and because very often people are concerned that the most important things they do become diluted when too many other responsibilities are added. But we all have to be expected to take a broad view of conservation. We all have to understand that it takes management, it takes science, and it takes enforcement and laws to make the conservation of wildlife work. You cannot pull one piece out and expect the system to work properly any more than you can take a piece out of a machine and expect that it will still run. I know from personal experience with a lot of agencies, including in Newfoundland, that it is often part of the jovial kind of poking of fun at one another that leads various aspects of the conservation movement to sort of tease one another, for scientists to tease enforcement officers, or officers to tease scientists, and managers and bureaucrats to be teased by everybody. And politicians, well, everybody has a view about that. But the truth of the matter is, we need everybody, don't we? I can poke fun at scientists because I am one. It's like there were two balloonists, you know. They were flying over a landscape, they got off track. They didn't have any idea where they were. So they're flying along, they're getting very concerned about this. 
lost their map. They look down and they see a fellow down below them. So they shout out. They said, hey. The guy looks up. They shout down. They say, where are we? The guy looks up at them and he says, you're about 150 feet up. So one of the balloonists turns to the other. He said, that guy's a scientist. The guy said, how do you know he's a scientist? Well, his answer was very accurate and totally useless. <laughs> There's an element of truth in it, isn't there? But the truth of the matter is that we all have to work together. And there are no limitations on the good any human being can do for conservation. This is one of the beauties of our profession. There are no limits on the good we can do. As a conservation officer, as an enforcement officer, your primary role deals with those issues of the law. But because of the role and the stature you have, you are able to reach people on many, many different fronts. Do you realize how few people in society have that opportunity. You can, by virtue of your status, of your uniform, of your presence, you can immediately reach people. There are many individuals who yearn to be able to have impact in conservation and have to work for years to get where you can be on your first day on the job. It's an incredible thing. Police officers primarily serve the public. They primarily serve people. They do an extraordinary job and obviously a critical one. But you, you serve both people and wildlife. And that is a really unique opportunity. Because these wild creatures will exist only because of us as people and the decisions we make. And on the other hand, what would a world be without them? I want every single person to ask themselves right now in this room what your lives would be if wildlife did not exist. If you never had the chance to see a wild turkey, if you never had the chance to see waterfowl come into a marsh, if you never had the chance to see an elk bugle in the morning in an alpine meadow and see that breath stream from that great creature and hear that sound, that unbelievable sound, or if you never had the chance to see a big carnivore, as controversial as they are, If there were no bears, if there were no wolves, if there were no mountain lion, if streams did not contain fishes, if no birds sang, can you imagine how bereft we would all be? You imagine if you could never look forward to having the chance of seeing those things. Well, unfortunately, that is the fate of billions of people in this world. For their entire lives, from the time they are young children till the time that they are old men and women. They will never have a chance to see anything like that. <laughs> Human
huge parts of the world contain billions of people who will never have a single one of those chances in the entirety of their 60, 70, or 80 years of life. But we do, practically every day. And not only that, you are engaged in making sure that it stays, not just for yourself or your own families, but for everyone in society. The law and citizenship are intimately connected. The reason that we have a conservation movement and the reason that you have the wildlife you do in this state and the reason we have so much wildlife on the North American continent is because people do care. Now I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that there are days when you wonder about that, just as I have. We have all had those experiences where it seems people don't care, or we meet individuals who we cannot figure out. We cannot understand why they have the attitudes they do, why they do the things they do. I know that every single conservation officer in this room has had that experience. But you know, even in the moment of your greatest frustration, that that is not how everyone feels. That there is a mass of good, moderate people who want and deserve to have a wildlife legacy. And we ought to put our challenges and our frustrations in perspective. The reason we have a North American model of conservation and the reason we have your organization is because approximately 120 years ago, a small group of people, groups of people scattered around this country, decided that they would not allow wildlife to disappear. Now I want you to think and put your own frustrations next to the challenges that those people faced. Wildlife was being eliminated from this continent. Forests were being denuded on this continent. Every salmon river was at risk on this continent. And people, people, it always takes a while, ladies and gentlemen, for the political elites to figure this out. People decided they would not let it happen. And the reason that we have a conservation movement today is because they set up a system of laws and policies and institutions that work. But think of the odds they faced. We didn't have any game laws, or very few, and the few we had were being broken continuously. We didn't have any game wardens. We didn't have any federal or state institutions. We didn't have any funding mechanisms. We didn't have any universities turning out graduates in wildlife biology. We didn't have any of the things that we rely upon today to make sure that conservation works. Not one. All we had were people who said we will not let it go. We do not care if big business wants to make big profits in destroying wildlife. We will not let it go. We do not care if we do not have all those institutions in place. It doesn't matter. We'll get there. But right now, we will not let it go. I will not have my country become a place where the children of tomorrow do not have the opportunity to see elk, do not have the opportunity to see mule deer, do not have an opportunity to see a grizzly bear. 
I will not allow my country to go there. And over time, the political elites, whether Theodore Roosevelt or whether the others in Congress who decided to pass good legislation, et cetera, et cetera, it took a while for them to realize that the people really did care about this. And finally, with the slaughter of the bison, it was determined they had had enough. Something new had to replace the slaughter we had. And that is what gave rise to your profession. Now here we are, 2013. Boone and Crocker Club was founded in 1887, so let's take that as a date. 126 years later, in the countries of Canada and the United States, when only a handful of people lived west of the Mississippi, at the time it was all started, and with all the social change that has taken place, two world wars and many wars in between, the changes in business, the changes in communication, the changes in urbanization, the changes in land ownership, all those changes, the changes in energy extraction, all of those changes over 125 years that have occurred, and yet we have a continent teeming with wildlife. So much so that we can put bumper stickers that say, white-tailed deer are rats with antlers. Canada geese are flying carp. Because when they become so numerous, we forget how precious they are. How many polar bears would we have to have before we call them something? But there was a time in that 126 years where if somebody saw the track of a white-tailed deer, children would be taken from school to see it. They end up on our bumpers, ladies and gentlemen, because we've done such a fantastic job of rescuing them. So we need to ask ourselves, what would have happened if we didn't? We lost the passenger pigeon. We lost the sea mink. We lost the Carolina parakeet. We lost the stellar sea cow. We lost the Labrador duck. We lost the Eskimo curlew. And on and on and on it could go. And we brought those iconic species like elk and mule deer and moose and bear and turkey and pronghorn. Do you realize that if you had had in the United States of America in 1900 or 1915 an Endangered Species Act, that every single one of those would have been listed. There's not one in 10,000 Americans or Canadians who ever think about that. There's probably not one in 100,000. But that's the truth. If there had been an Endangered Species Act and we had had organizations like yours, a major part of your job would have been to enforce the Endangered Species Act, not relative to marble murlets, or spotted owls, or lots of small little creatures in the reptile and amphibian groups that nobody seems to know what to do with, or rare plants. No. The things we fight about, the things we worry the wolves will eat, they would 
have all been listed. But even in the absence of an Endangered Species Act, the same people who started the movement and didn't care that we didn't have universities and didn't care that we didn't have organizations like yours and didn't care that we didn't have funding mechanisms said, we will not lose them. And who were these people? We remember the big names. We remember the Roosevelts and the Grinnells and the Pinchots, the Hewitts, the Lauriers. We remember the Muirs and the Burroughs. Oh yes, we remember the few big ones that history has somehow thrown up to us. Do you know who saved the shorebirds of your country? When a pound of egret feathers in the United States of America was worth three times a pound of gold, three times, and when those rookeries, those nesting colonies were just being denuded of birds for their feathers to put in hats. One of the most vital forces in the United States of America to shut that down. Over. Done. No more. Never again. Never again. It never happened again. were the women who were fighting for the right to vote in this country. And when those women's groups organized to fight the destruction of the egrets and the herons, etc., no force could stop them. We don't remember their names but they were legion strong. And they gave you a wildlife legacy. And they gave all of us a responsibility that we cannot deny. Some people say, we've done such a great job, we don't need to worry about it anymore. There'll always be a little bit of illegal activity, and there'll always be a bit of this and a bit of that, but we don't have to really worry. We have wildlife in abundance. We've brought the wild turkey back from 75,000 or so back to five or six million, and we brought the pronghorn back from tens of thousands to the numbers we have today, and we brought the whitetail back from maybe half a million to maybe 20 or 30. We brought the black bear back. We've got so many Canada geese, we don't know what to do with them. We've got turkeys in our driveways, you know, geese on our on our uh, golf courses, uh, you know, what's the big deal? And for the average citizen living in a downtown part of some major city in the United States or Canada, maybe it all seems good to them. But I, I come from Newfoundland. I was conceived, born, Rare, and I will die there because there is no other part of this planet that can ever mean as much to me. This is the oldest non native culture in North America, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about. And so we fished for cod. Some people farm, some people ranch, some people log, some people mine. We fished. And we fished, and we fished, and we fished for 500 years. We in the countries of Europe, and more wealth floated in the sodden bellies of those ships leaving Newfoundland and going to the countries of Europe and around the world in the form of fish, gutted and splayed, than the energy industry has yet to assemble. 
from our island. And in 1992, not 1892, not 1792, but in 1992, the fishing of the Northern Cod, which was the greatest assemblage we had, and probably the greatest assemblage of life the planet, or one of them, the planet has ever known, fishing was ended, illegal. You couldn't even catch one to eat. It was forbidden by law for us to catch one to eat. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of communities whose only existence was based upon that animal. And they were told, no matter how much talent you've developed, no matter how tough you are, no matter how much skill you have, no matter that in the graveyard next to your homes, your father, your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather lies buried and fished, you will not catch one to eat. And by that time, ladies and gentlemen, we had all those institutions. We had the universities. We had the trained scientists. We had the enforcement. We had the political attention. We had it all. And we lost it all. So don't you ever think that it's safe, because I'm here to tell you, to your face, you would be a fool to think so. Whatever we have achieved, whatever you have achieved, can and may well be taken, and it certainly will be, if we do not remain vigilant. In a recent article for Sports Afield magazine, I covered the circumstances facing rhino, primarily in Africa, but the other species as well. We have a situation now where rhino horn is one by weight is one of the most valuable commodities in the world, by far. And we have a virtually insatiable market for that product in Vietnam, the parts of Southeast Asia, various parts of the world. And as we speak, individuals armed like soldiers, are seeking these animals out, killing them, cutting their faces off with chainsaws, and exporting the horn. We also have people who have decided that it's less risky if you don't have to discharge a firearm. And so they've learned to use the drugs that we use to immobilize animals to dart the rhinos and then proceed to cut their faces off. The problem is, of course, that many of those people are not trained in the use of those drugs and they often underestimate what it's required to put down these massive animals. But as long as the animal is quiet enough 
that they can start that chainsaw and rip it up to the front of his face to take off that horn or those two horns, that's all that really matters. And then when that beast awakens, he awakens with the entire top of his face gone, a massive wound and opening in his body in absolute torture. and ultimately dies, of course. In pursuit of those individuals who undertake this, there are others, equally well-armed, who in some cases shoot to kill. So we have human beings doing this to animals for money, and then we have human beings killing those human beings to stop them from doing it. Now, the human beings who are making the most money, of course, are not the ones who are shooting the rhinos. Most of the men who are shooting or snaring or darting or killing the rhinos are poor people, really poor people, people so poor that no one here in this room can really relate to the level of poverty that they experience. They have an opportunity to make some money. For what? For their children. Not to buy an iPad, but to buy shoes. Not to buy a cell phone, but to buy food. But yet, they risk their lives to do it for their children. We do not know how we are going to stop this problem. But if we don't stop it within a very short period of time, rhinos will not exist in the wild. We may still have them in zoos, or on some private land, but they will not exist ever again in the wild. I raise this issue because we need sometimes in North America to reflect on the scale of our problems. I gave a lecture last summer in Durban, South Africa and at the end of the lecture, a lady came up to me and she said, you know, one thing you ought to remember, Mr. Mahoney, is that we're not talking about energy development and mule deer or sage grouse. We're not talking about the damming of rivers and how that might affect salmon. They're all terrible things or challenging things. No. Our people are eating wildlife out of existence. So what solution do you have for that? Now, I think we ought to put those experiences in perspective. I know your jobs are not easy. Believe me, I do. I know the enforcement officers in Newfoundland very well. I knew Howard very well, Howard Labor. Very well. So I'm not some guy who spent his time walking around like a freak in the wilderness and doesn't know what it takes to get the job done. I do. But we have to realize how extraordinarily fortunate we are to live where we do and to have the opportunities we have to make our places even better. I can assure you that there is almost no difference between any of us and any of the rest of the people in the world when it comes down to the most important things. And yet we have the chance. I step into your airport 
and I see this collage of photographs of the wild beauty of this state. You have the chance to experience that, if you want, almost any time. We are trying to fight for perhaps more elk, or less of this, or more of that, or a better solution here or there. But we ought to keep in mind that while we are frustrated in doing it, we are starting from a level so high compared with most people in the world that we sometimes must realize that we are fortunate to have the problems we do. And if others before you had not cared as much, we would not have that opportunity. And if we do not learn to care just as much and to work just as hard and to sacrifice just as much, then the young children who are just scampering around this room will have far less chance. And when they have their children, it is entirely possible that they will have far less again until ultimately there can be people in the United States and Canada who have no chance. Intellect is important, ladies and gentlemen. Ideas are important. But I believe that this, this big brain that we all have, is just a scaffold for this. This is what makes the difference. This is what saved wildlife. This is what builds great nations. This is what makes us work for generations that we will never know, but we believe have the same rights to a wildlife legacy and a natural world that is functioning and beautiful, this. So I don't care what education a man or woman has. I don't really care how much money a man or woman has. I don't really care at all where they come from. What I care about is whether they've got enough in here to have them contribute to what I believe is the most important mission facing humankind. And that is to make sure that wild creatures stay with us. They taught us to be human, ladies and gentlemen. They were the ones who made us realize we were different. To every hunter in this room, I don't know how many there are, but let me say one more thing specifically to those who do hunt. If you don't think you've got an even greater responsibility to those wild creatures than anybody else, I'm asking you to think again. Because the day any one of us squeezes that trigger or releases that arrow, and takes the life willingly of one of those incredible animals, as I have done. Our responsibility shoots upward. Those of us who hunt have no possible escape from our responsibility to fight for wildlife. Fortunately, we have proven for over a century and a quarter, that we, along with many others, like the women who were pushing for the right to vote, will fight for wildlife in its continuance. I thank you very much for all you do. And you may take it as a compliment and a thank you from somebody who knows, because I do know this business. And I do love wildlife. And I will work for them 
as the primary reason for my existence till I breathe no more. Thank you very much.